Hey guys, Tierra here with Doc Girl Fitness, and today's video is all about my weeks three and four update and Q and A about my hip surgery at age 26. For those of you who don't know, I'm Dr. Tierra Range, a resident physician in pediatrics who makes videos about medicine, lifestyle, and fitness. If that sounds like something you may enjoy, then make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you never miss another video. So today's video will be a little bit different. I don't have clips to show you from throughout the last couple of weeks, but what I can do for you today is show you how I've been moving around and kind of catch you up with everything that's been going on and answer some questions that people have been asking me either in the comment section of some of my other videos or people who have been reaching out to me personally and asking questions who have hip dysplasia and just wanna know more about my process of going through this journey. So I'll start with the update. So the last time I saw you all, I was very excited because I was getting out of bed on my own. I was getting into bed on my own. I still needed help getting into the shower and with some other small tasks but I was really starting to improve. I was having pain and I was having some really good days and some really bad days, but that's pretty much where I was at the last time I was with you all. Since that time, I have now moved. I was in a place that had stairs and it just really wasn't feasible to be going up and down stairs every single day like that. So I moved to a place that is more handicap accessible and it just made sense for me to do that. Now, if you have hip dysplasia, you don't have to upend your entire life and move like that. Uh, it just made more sense for me because I had my left hip done and I may be having my right hip done as early as within the next several months. And for about another year and a half in total, I'll be dealing with a lot of recuperation and recovery, and it just made sense for me to move. So I did that, and in the process of doing that, I've also been kind of getting out there. For the most part, before I was just taking strolls around the neighborhood with my dad in my wheelchair, but now I'm actually going to stores and getting inside of an electric scooter taking my wheelchair inside of other stores, using my own arm strength to get around on my wheelchair, and I feel a lot more independent now than I did before, and I really appreciate that. In addition to moving to a more handicap accessible environment, I also bought a couple of things to make my environment more handicap accessible. For example, I had a shower chair that was really great for a standalone shower, but in the process of moving, I moved to a place that has a bathtub and a shower together, and because that height of the tub was so high, I needed to get a transfer chair. So I got a transfer shower chair, which was a game changer because I do still have my parents help but eventually I'll be doing all of this on my own and so I'm really able to use that transfer shower chair to transfer from outside of the shower to inside of the shower and then back outside of the shower with a lot more efficiency and I can do it all by myself. Something else I've gotten that has made my life a lot easier actually pertains to something that I mentioned to you all in my previous video. I told you all that I was having a lot of pain in my palms just from walking around on that walker all the time and lifting my entire body weight just to hop on one leg. So my parents went out and bought me these cushions and I'll make sure to include a video clip of these, but they bought me these cushions that actually wrap around the walker and I'm looking down because I always have my walker in front of me at all times. So these cushions actually wrap around the handlebars of the walker and they are like little pillows for my hands. And then in addition to that, I talked to my physical therapist from my hospital stay who gave me some pointers about how to adjust my stance while walking to alleviate the weight and pressure that I'm putting on my palms. According to her, it's a common issue that a lot of people face who have to use a walker or have to use crutches because you get so used to leaning forward that you actually end up leaning forward too much and hyperextending your wrists and in doing so you're placing all of your body weight onto your palms and that's why your palms end up so sore so it was her recommendation to me to only lay my body forward about 15 degrees while on the walker and to not push the walker so far in front of me that i end up having to lean forward so much and then having to kind of gallop ahead to reach my walker so it ended up requiring me to take shorter steps but they were much more efficient steps and I wasn't so exhausted by the end of each trip on the walker. 
not too long after the two-week update that I gave you all in my last video. I had my two-week post-op follow-up appointment with the pediatric orthopedic surgeon who performed my operation, and he said that I'm healing very well. He looked at all of my incision sites, all my scars are healing great, and in addition to that, he said that my mobility is really going well with the exercises. And I'll include a clip here of some of the exercises I've been doing. As you can see here, I am taking my leg and I am lifting it up and I am lifting up the entire weight of my leg with only my arms. I am not using any of my hip flexural muscles at all. I'm literally only using my hands and my arm strength to lift up my leg. And in the process of doing so, I'm supposed to lift up my knee to my chest and hold it there for 10 seconds. And I do this 10 times in one setting and I do this five sets per day. So I performed this exercise for my pediatric orthopedic surgeon and he said that I was progressing well enough to move on to a new exercise and I'll insert a clip here of what that exercise looks like. So as you can see here, I continue to still lift my knee up to my chest, but then after doing that, I put it in what's called a figure of four stretch, where I then kind of put my leg into a tabletop form, and then same thing, hold for 10 seconds, do it 10 times within one set, and do five sets in a day. Things that I've noticed about myself that have changed physically include a lot of muscle atrophy, which is to be expected. Uh, I would recommend that anybody who has a surgery just keep in mind that in any environment where you're not providing any weight or using any muscle for six weeks at a time, you're going to have muscle atrophy. I was surprised by how quickly my muscles had atrophied in my left leg. It was about two weeks in that my dad started saying to me, Tira, have you noticed that your left leg is starting to get a lot smaller than your right leg? Now it's definitely a lot more noticeable, even in the way that my pants fit. One pant leg will be kind of loose and the other will fit more snugly. It's all a part of the journey and with a lot of physical therapy and a lot of recovery and just working on weight bearing, when that time comes, all of that strength and all of that muscle and all of that tone will come back. My only other updates are that now I'm doing telemedicine from home and it's really great to be working with patients again and starting next week I'll be slowly incorporating myself back to on-campus life and will be on site for a few days every week until I'm eventually back full-fledged working in the hospital every single day. As I mentioned to you before, my program really worked with me and they were so kind to do that. They kind of worked with my schedule based off of when I would be able to start bearing weight again, which for me is only in two more weeks. I can't believe it, I'm so excited. So by that time, I really will be kind of fully incorporated back into the hospital. But until then, they were very willing to work with me and let me do most of my appointments from home with some check-ins and the hospital here and there. So a few questions that I have received about the surgery. So one question I received was about my timeline. Somebody asked me how long after my diagnosis of hip dysplasia did I wait until I received my surgery? So by the time I got my diagnosis of hip dysplasia, I was really running out of options. I knew I was going to need some sort of surgical intervention. I just did not have the diagnosis of hip dysplasia yet. I thought it was going to be more of a minor procedure as opposed to a major double procedure. But I found out September 29th of this year. And then he said, just let me know when you're ready to have the procedure. And my earliest availability was November 9th. Now I created that timeline for myself based off of my resident work schedule. As a resident, we are given which rotations we'll be working on throughout the year early on. Like on the first day of residency, I already know in what order all of my rotations will be. And I know what rotations are lighter than other rotations. And I also know what rotations could be done via telemedicine if it came down to it and if I really needed that. During that November block, I knew that I was going to be in a lighter rotation and I was going to have the ability to kind of work from home if I needed to. And I worked with my chief residents. I kind of told them my entire situation and they said, hey, that sounds like a really good date to me. Go ahead and sign up for it so you don't miss out on the opportunity to have that surgery that day. So I went ahead and signed up for November 9th. So it wasn't, it, I only had about 
four and a half weeks to really kind of prepare myself for the surgery. But to be honest, by the time that I was diagnosed with hip dysplasia, I'd had a little bit longer than that to prepare. Before I had my official diagnosis of hip dysplasia, I had seen an adult orthopedic surgeon inquiring about receiving some kind of physical therapy for what had already been diagnosed as a hip labral tear. And it was him who actually informed me that I had really severe hip dysplasia and that I needed a formal diagnosis by a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. That was actually done in early August, but if you are somebody with hip dysplasia, my number one suggestion to you would be to work with your pediatric orthopedic surgeon or your adult orthopedic surgeon first and see what they think about your specific hip dysplasia, the severity of your hip dysplasia, how long it can wait or when they think would be the best time for you to have it, and then talk with your job or with your school, depending on the situation that you're currently in and see with them what timeline looks best for them. I feel like if you include everybody in the process on the front end and everybody already knows what you're going through, everybody is incredibly willing to work with you because they already know everything up front. Another question I received was how much help do you need? How much support do you need going into a surgery like this? And let me tell you, you need all the support you can get. Not only have I had the support of my parents, but also my fiance, I keep in contact with my physical therapist. I have friends in the area who are my co-residents who check on me all the time. I have co-residents who are willing to pick me up and drop me off to the campus. I already have that set up in advance. And then that's, a, you know, that's something that you just have to keep in mind. You have to prepare everything in advance. Uh, it used to take me five minutes to take a shower and now it takes me an hour. Even if I'm doing it on my own, even if I have help from my parents, it doesn't matter. It takes me an hour to take a shower now. And if it takes me an hour just to take a shower, you can imagine how long it would take to transport me from one place to the next, including the time that it takes to take out the wheelchair and then reassemble some of its parts for me to then be able to get out of my car and into the wheelchair. Then it takes me longer if I don't have somebody to push me in the wheelchair at a faster rate, then I have to use my arms to be able to do that myself. And I can only move my arms so quickly, so. There's just so many things you have to consider as far as how much support you're going to need. And you don't really think about those things ahead of time unless you have to. So I encourage anybody who's about to have the surgery to really maybe take a notebook and write down all of the people that you think could be there for you and help you uh, because you don't wanna just overuse the same people who have been supporting you. You want a big network of people who can be there for you and who understand what it takes to take care of somebody who's essentially disabled for the time being. Okay guys, so those were some of the major questions that people asked me, but if there's anything else that's specific that you want me to go over in regards to the surgery, the recovery time, what I have coming up next, how medicine, lifestyle, and fitness is going, please feel free to reach out and ask me those things. I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you like this video, make sure to give it a big thumbs up. If you have any questions or you just wanna chat, make sure to let me know in the comment section below. And if you like videos about medicine, lifestyle, and fitness, then make sure to subscribe to my channel. I'll see you next time.